So once again, welcome back to the session, everyone. So in the last day's session, I mean, the la over the last three days, we have revised about the areas of audit risk, internal control deficiencies, then substantive procedures, and all of the main areas. So in today's session, we will be primarily focusing on three main areas, one in relating to the reporting part, the other one in relating to corporate governance, and other areas in relating to ethics as well. And we will start with the area of ethics first. So, well, we have already studied in our regular session properly about the ethics. And well, we know that there is one of the most common question that you should use to appear. That's the fundamental ethical principles. The examiner might ask you to explain the fundamental ethical principles or ACCS code of ethics and conduct. So principles of professional ethics, fundamental ethical principles, ACCA code of conduct, the lamp is same guy in the energy than our. So which all were the fundamental ethical principles, integrity, objectivity, professional competence and due care, confidentiality and professional behavior. So these are the five fundamental ethical principles. Integrity, objectivity, professional competence and due care, confidentiality and professional behavior. So basically when it comes to integrity, it means that the members should be always straightforward and honest in all their business and professional relationships. We are in business and professional relationship. We are honest. 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 We Objectivity. Then, when it comes to professional competence and due care, it means that whenever an auditor is involved with a client company, they should always be providing the client company with the most up to date class of work. So, before accepting every work, they need to consider whether they are having adequate amount of competence or whether they have sufficient knowledge. And they should attain the work only if they have got proper knowledge in that work. In addition to which, the auditor should always keep on updating his knowledge. Auditor applicant and knowledge update and address applicant knowledge properly up to date and keep in the down. Then next one is confidentiality. The confidentiality will mainly consist of two things. First of all, when we get an information from a client company, we should not disclose it to any other person unless there is a legal or professional duty or there is approval from the client. In addition to which, once you get an information from the client company, you should not use it for any other purpose. Other than the purpose for which you have obtained that. If you have a client who has information obtained, what is the purpose of the information? What is the purpose of the information? What is the purpose of the confidentiality? Then, basically, when it comes to professional behavior, it means that as a member, you must always be complying with law and regulation, and you should not do any act that may discredit the profession. If you have a client who has law and regulation, you should not do any professional body in a discredit in that alone in cm party land or in a professional behavior then moving on threats to professional ethics there are five fundamental uh sorry there are five threats which will fundamentally affect a auditor in maintaining objectivity out of his first threat is a self-interest threat. so it's a situation where an auditor will be giving more importance to his own personal interest rather than the professional interest upper auditor i all the person interest in eric and cool importance would go professional interest in a guy look other than a possibility in a self-interest threat and like yeah and mainly it occurs uh when it comes to the case where the auditor is getting a gift of hospitality a legal auditor can get a loan a legal guarantee client coming to an auditor of here or a legal auditor to go to the end when there is overdue fee we know that when there is overdue fee there is two possibility first thing the auditor might think that if the auditor have given an inappropriate opinion in the sense that if the auditor is giving an unfavorable opinion for the client company in that case the client might not be willing to pay the existing out outstanding fees also so in that case auditor might be forced to give a favorable opinion for the client that's the first case abam auditor ku pare fees kittu annalla paid ida porthu auditor endey favorable opinion kodukum allengilo there can be chances that when there is overdue fee auditor might be having a fear that the fees might not be recoverable in that case auditor will reduce the quality of the audit so that's a situation where self interest rate will arise then if the fees is on the basis of percentage or contingent basis say for example profit in a 5 percentage on fees no worry and profit in a state and on a lot of the correct number you know because order in the fees according to order correct him but I love 
high percentage fees. We have studied that for two consecutive years, if an audit firm is receiving more than 15% of a client company's revenue uh, from a single, uh, sorry, if the audit firm is getting 15% of their total revenue from a single client, that is something called high percentage fees. Audit firm in the total revenue into 15 percentage maybe a single client under the high percentage client. Under. So there's always possibility of having providing a favorable opinion in order to retain that client. So we must be using an external quality control reviewer to perform the review of the work performed by the auditor as a safeguard. So basically, when it comes to low bowling, it's a situation where we will reduce the amount of audit fee. Correspondingly, we will reduce the quality of the audit. About audit fees so for a game, I know open the quality of the audit reducing in the number of low bowling area. When it comes to recruitment, consider that audit firm have appointed an employee in the client company. So in that case, if the employee is working in accounts department, and if the employee have done some kind of wrong flag, in that case, auditor will not talk against that particular person because it will also affect the auditor's credibility. So he will not talk against the particular person. So it will create self-interest. Right? Consider that we have a financial interest in the client company. We have an investment in shares or debentures. In that case, if we talk about the client company, there can be chances that we might also lose our money. So in order to avoid that situation, we will not talk against the client. So if there is any close business relationship, or if we have already been employed with the client company in the previous years, or if any of the audit firm's partner is working in the client company's board of directors, in all these situations, self-interest threat will arise. So this is a situation where there is possibility of having self-interest threat to objectivity. So wherever there is situation that shows that or it will give more importance on his own personal interest rather than professional interest. It will give rise to self-interest threat. Then the next one is self-review threat. So basically, when it comes to self-review threat, consider that an auditor have performed any sort of uh, financial reporting related services for the client company. And now he is also responsible for reviewing that. So in that case, definitely the auditor will not talk against himself. So that is something called self-interest threat. Namakaryam, or auditor or a client company QA and data, and financial reporting related service already say the good. I'm going to pin it the same auditor than our Kagan said some Zarigam Nilling Avo, Illa, a power and down the threat on a self review threat. So let it be any services, if it directly or indirectly affects a com client company's financial reporting, it can be treated as a self review threat. The next one is advocacy threat. So basically, when it comes to advocacy threat, there's always a possibility that. The auditor might represent the client company at a point. Auditor, every angle and client company could represent either some side and some out and down the threat on advocacy threat on area. And when it comes to familiarity threat, so consider that there is just a relation between the auditor and the client company, which is beyond professional relationship. Say, for example, the auditor and the client company's CEO is going together for a movie, or if they are together going and attending other casual functions. In all this situation, if it is a relation which is beyond the professional relation, it can be considered as a familiarity threat. Or else, if there is any long-term relationship with the client company, like we are employed with the client company for over a period of seven years, can you aid or to continue as a client company than a work year? So the possibility of having familiarity threat will be high. Then, intimidation threat. So basically, the intimidation threat will arise in three situations when there is possibility of having coercion, Undue influence or creating limitation in the scope of audit. So basically, say for example, consider that um, <clears throat> there is coercion. Coercion or the bishni nanavaraya auditor is being threatened by the client company. Say for example, the auditor is not provided with sufficient audit fee, or in other words, the auditor is threatened by telling him that the client company will not be willing to provide the uh, next year's audit or any other related services. Second one is undue influence. The client company is using influence indirectly or directly to give a specific opinion. Like say, for example, your uh, family member is working with a client company or consider that any of your previous firm's auditor or your seniors were, um, who were there in your previous audit firm or the current audit firm have joined the client company. And now they are in such a position to influence you. In that case also, it will give us rise to intimidation threat. Or else if there is any possibility of having limitation in the scope of audit, say for example, if you're not getting sufficient time for the purpose of performing the audit, if you're not getting access to a specific information, client is not willing to provide you a particular information. In all this situation also, intimidation threat will arise. 
പ്രോപ്പർലി ഓഡിറ്റ് പെർഫോം ചെയ്യാനായിട്ടുള്ള എബിലിറ്റി ഇല്ലാണ്ടാക്കുന്നത് അവിടെയൊക്കെ എന്തുണ്ടാവും ഇൻഡിമിനേഷൻ ത്രെഡ് ഉണ്ടാവും സോ യു ക്യാൻ ഡിസ്റ്റിംഗ്യൂഷ് ബിറ്റ്വീൻ ദിസ് ത്രെഡ്സ് കൺസിഡർ ദാൻ ദർ ആർ ടു റിസ്ക് സോറി ടു ത്രെഡ്സ് വിച്ച് യു ക്യാൻ എൻറ്റയർലി ഡിസ്റ്റിംഗ്യൂഷ് ദ ഫസ്റ്റ് വൺ ഈസ് സെൽഫ് റിവ്യൂ സോറി യാ സെൽഫ് റിവ്യൂ ആൻഡ് ദ അതർ വൺ ഈസ് അഡ്വക്കേസി so basically when it comes to self review that threat will arise only in one situation where you have already performed a financial reporting related service for the client company and when it comes to self interest that sorry uh, advocacy it will arise only when you represent the client company at a point the connected threats are familiarity self interest and intimidation so if there is a family or personal relationship with any member in the client company it can result in these three threats but different situations say for example if your wife is working with a client company definitely there can be chances that you might act in your own personal interest so that will be self interested consider that you are having a personal relation with one of the member in the client company so in that case it may be because of the familiarity and consider that somebody else in the audit firm uh, is being influenced by one member from the client company in that case it will be intimidation threat അപ്പൊ നിങ്ങളെ ഭീഷണിപ്പെടുത്തുവോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ നിങ്ങളെ അണ്ടിയൂലി ഇൻഫ്ലുവൻസ് ചെയ്യുകയോ ചെയ്താൽ ഇൻറ്റിമിഡേഷൻ ആവുള്ളൂ നിങ്ങൾ അവർ തമ്മിലുള്ള ഒരു മിയർ പരിചയത്തിന് പുറത്ത് മാത്രമാണ് നിങ്ങൾ എന്തെങ്കിലും കാര്യങ്ങൾ അവർക്ക് വേണ്ടിട്ട് ചെയ്യാൻ വില്ലിങ് ആവുന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ അതെന്തായിരിക്കും അത് ഫെമിലിയാരിറ്റി ആയിരിക്കും ബിയോണ്ട് ദാറ്റ് ആണ് നിങ്ങളുടെ സെൽഫ് ഇൻട്രസ്റ്റ് കൊണ്ട് നോക്കുകയാണ് നിങ്ങൾ ചെയ്യുന്നെങ്കിലാണ് സെൽഫ് ഇൻട്രസ്റ്റഡ് ആവുന്നത് ദെൻ ദർ ഇസ് ഓൾസോ പോസിബിലിറ്റി ഓഫ് ഹാവിങ് മാനേജ്മെന്റ് ത്രെഡ് വേ ബൈ ദ ക്യാൻ ബി ചാൻസസ് ആൻഡ് ദ ഓഡിറ്റർ മൈറ്റ് അസ്യൂം സം ഓഫ് ദി മാനേജ്മെന്റ് റെസ്പോൺസിബിലിറ്റി ആസ് പാർട്ട് ഓഫ് ദി ഓഡിറ്റ് ഫോംസ് റെസ്പോൺസിബിലിറ്റി which might affect his independence that's called management threat ab auditor chala situations in the management in the responsibilities and audit firm in the responsibility at assume cheyidu work him angane undavanulla possibility yana management threat annu lekka and to understand about the significance of the threat we need to consider the value seniority of the staff impact to the firm and materiality to the financial statements if the value of the threat is high automatically the threat will be high then significance of the threat will be high if the seniority of the person associated with the threat is in a higher rank then automatically the threat will be high if the impact created to the audit firm is high automatically threat will be high if the materiality to the client company's financial statements is high the threat significance will also be high and whenever there is threat we know that we should always be taking adequate safeguards to overcome that threat ab endakana safeguards edukanam nu parna so whenever there is a significant issue you can discuss the issue with the client companies audit committee or with those charged with governance same as that if you want to remove any particular person from the audit team you can do that say for example in the client company um, audit manager's wife is working as the cfo in that case automatically the audit manager might be influenced so we can remove that audit manager from the audit team and in case wherever there is possibility of having reducing quality of the engagement then we can obtain an external review of the work done whenever there is possibility of having familiarity threat we can rotate the senior person we can use two separate team for avoiding the self review threat throughout the audit we can always consider maintaining professional skepticism as a general point we can seek advice from the professional body we can maintain organizational code of conduct whatever services are requested to be performed by the auditor that can be politely declined and in case if a particular member is having any financial interest in the client company he need to dispose of that interest immediately and finally in every cases auditor can consider resigning from the engagement if adequate safeguards cannot be taken by the auditor then in addition to this you might be getting a scenario whereby they might be asking you uh, about the threat that might arise when you audit multiple entities in a competent market with the same industry or multiple entities in you audit in the same time അവിടെ എന്തൊക്കെ ത്രെഡ്സ് ആണ് ഉണ്ടാവാൻ ചാൻസ് ഉള്ളതെന്ന് നിങ്ങളോട് ചോദിക്കും സോ ദൈ ക്യാൻ ബി ചാൻസസ് ഓഫ് ഹാവിങ് ത്രെഡ് ടു ഇൻഡിപെൻഡൻസ് ആൻഡ് ഒബ്ജക്ടിവിറ്റി ആസ് വെൽ ആസ് ദൈ ക്യാൻ ബി പോസിബിലിറ്റി ഓഫ് ഹാവിങ് ഇഷ്യൂസ് റിലേറ്റിംഗ് ടു കോൺഫിഡൻഷ്യാലിറ്റി ആസ് വെൽ സോ ദർ ആസ് ടു സിറ്റുവേഷൻ ഇൻ റിലേഷൻ ടു ദിസ് വെൻ വി ഓഡിറ്റ് മൾട്ടിപ്പിൾ കമ്പനി ഇൻ എ സെയിം മാർക്കറ്റ് ഓ വെൻ വി ഓഡിറ്റ് എൻഡിറ്റീസ് ദ ട്രേഡ് വിത്ത് ഈച്ച് അതർ ദ ക്യാൻ ബി ചാൻസസ് ആർ വി മൈ ഓഡിറ്റ് ആപ്പിൾ ആൻഡ് സാംസങ് ടുഗേദർ സോ ദീസ് ആർ ദ എൻഡിറ്റീസ് ഓൺ ദ സെയിം ഇൻഡസ്ട്രി ദർ കോമ്പീറ്റ് ഈച്ച് അതർ there can be chances that we might audit apple and intel company so these are the companies that trade with each other so in that situation there can be possibility of having threats to objectivity and confidentiality so the first safeguard that needs to be taken by the auditor nammalo appa safeguards aarikum normally ingane the question choikka safeguard yojichu kenjal aadyam nammal parayanadathu what we need to do is we need to notify both the client rendu client ne nammal ee kaari inform cheyanam ennittu avare kaiyina consent vaanganam we need to obtain consent from them 
and if they have provided us the consent then in that case we need to use separate engagement team for both the client then there should be procedures to prevent access to information apple's information should not be sent to samsung or vice versa then the confidentiality agreement need to be signed by each of the engagement team members then we need to regularly review the application of safeguards and we need to give independence advice to the client company and if we are not able to follow any of the above mentioned safeguard we should decline or resign from the order engagement and as we learned earlier for the engagement partner engagement quality control reviewer and for the key audit partner for all of them the period serve will be same they can only serve a maximum of 7 years with the same audit line the cooling off period will only be different for an engagement partner the cooling off period will be 5 years for an engagement quality control reviewer it will be 3 years and for the key audit partner it will be 2 years is that clear everyone okay yeah so basically during the course of your exam you might be getting a question from the area of ethical ethics and ethical threads so the examiner might be asking you to identify and explain ethical threads and you might need to provide a safeguard to overcome th that threat so whenever you get a scenario like this you must be considering about all the ethical threads that might arise from the scenario and you need to mention about the appropriate safeguards that you need to take so when you get a question on ethics you need to provide the ethical threads and safeguards for the same so whenever you mention about the ethical thread first of all you need to identify the threat from the scenario ab scenario kathula ethical threat endano ad identify cheyanam secondly you need to explain it explain it in the sense you need to mention which threat it is and how you need to consider it as threat that need to be explained and as a safeguard you need to mention about what needs to be done by the auditor to overcome this threat so let's do one thing let's read this two paragraph and let's try to identify threats from the scenario and the related safeguard The finance directory is keen to announce company's financial results to stock market earlier than last year, and in order to facilitate this, he has asked if the audit could be completed in a shorter time scale. In addition, company is intending to propose a final dividend once the financial statements are finalized. Herling Company's finance director has informed the audit engagement partner that one of the company's non-executive director has just resigned. and he has enquired if the partners at cnco can help herling company in recruiting a new non executive director okay so they have mentioned about a scenario and you need to pick whatever that things went wrong with this scenario okay so tell me what all are the ethical threats here endigal ethical threat undu avade endake maklai ethical threat scenario ka tholla audit could be done in a shorter time scale okay so they have asked whether the audit could be done in a shorter time scale so what will be the threat in that case and there can threat vera so first of all you need to identify that you need to mention that the finance director has requested the audit engagement partner to complete the audit in a shorter time scale yeah right one let it can I mention it over the mic so what will be the threat you need to mention that this may give rise to a intimidation threat to objectivity as there are possibilities that the auditor might be pressured to reduce the quality of the audit engagement because the auditor will not be able to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence in a shorter time scale so this is what you need to mention as the ethical threat 
And then you need to mention the safeguard. What should be the safeguard in this case? And then you can safeguard it under the. So anyway, you won't be able to perform the audit in a shorter time scale. Up in the end of the discuss with the management. The auditor engagement partner should discuss with the management whether they will be provided with additional time scale for the purpose of performing the audit engagement in accordance with the standards. And if not, the auditor should politely decline the engagement and he should not continue with it. So this is what you need to give us the safeguard. Clear? Okay. Then what else is the ethical thread here? Where ethical thread and the where in the ethical threat and no scenario? Hence exactly. in recruiting new NAD. Ah, exactly. The audit engagement partner has been asked to help them in recruiting new non-executive director for the hurling company. So what will be the threat in that case, ethical threat in that case? Which ethical threat will arise when we help them in recruiting a new NAD? Exactly. We can mention that it will create or it will give rise to self-interested, right? So you can mention that the company have requested whether the audit firm can help them in recruiting new non-executive directors. Therefore, there can be chances of having self-interested to objectivity as the audit firm cannot undertake the recruitment of members to the board of directors of the company as the non-executive directors will be responsible for overseeing the audit process. So what should be the recommendation in that case? The same thing, you can politely decline it. So the auditor should communicate the matter with the client company's management and those charged with governance and should inform them that the auditor will not be able to be part of the process of recruitment of client company staff members, including the non-executive directors. So that is what you need to give us the safeguard, clear? Is that clear everyone? Okay, so you need to identify the threat from the scenario, explain it why it is considered as threat and mention which threat it is. And as a safeguard, you need to mention about what you need to do in order to overcome this threat. Manslai Maklai, clear? Okay. Then this is how you need to give answers for the area of threat. So I believe it's clear. So we have got five ethical threats in total. Self-interest threat, self-review threat, advocacy, familiarity, and intimidation. Okay. Then next one. Let's move on to the next area of corporate governance. So, well, we know that when it comes to the area of corporate governance, these are the policies and procedures, or these are the way in which an organization should be directed and controlled in the interest of the shareholders and stakeholders. Our company shareholders name, stakeholders in interest and answer or organization in a run in the Parainaniana, corporate governance in the Namulikan and Dawa. So, first of all, as per corporate governance guidelines, we know that the firm should be properly following leadership related responsibility, which means the board should be headed by an effect, sorry, the company should be headed by an effective board, and always the board should be looking for the company's long term success. So, an effective board of directors are going to company run the our important focus in the company and long term success to promote the And same as that, there should be a clear division of responsibility between the head of the company and between running of the board. So, who will be the head of the company? It will be the chairman, sorry, it will be the CEO, and the run, uh, running of the board is the responsibility of the chairman. So, which means literally. Chairman and CEO should be separate. Chairman and CEO are not going to be able Unfettered powers are not going Undivided powers are not going to be able to do separate persons. Then, the chairman will be responsible for the leadership of the board and he is responsible for making sure the effectiveness of the role. And the chairman should be the member of unitary board. And whenever there is a decision which is being taken by the executive directors that should be challenged by the non-executive directors. Our unitary bond at the non-executive directors in a duty are executive directors in a challenge. Then when it comes to effectiveness, there should be a balance of skills, experience, independence, and knowledge. Now the board proper skill and experience and independence and board should always be balanced, which means 
equal number of executives and non executive directors should be there so say for example if there are three non executive directors there should be three executive directors also then there should be a formal rigorous and transparent procedure for the appointment of new directors to the board so directors should be appointed only by passing proper resolutions and all are venelum directors ayi pidich include yan pattilla and each of the directors should spend sufficient time to discharge their responsibilities effectively oru directors um sufficient aitulla time spend cheyidittu mathrame avaru responsibilities effectively carry out cheyan paarullu and all the directors should receive a training that is induction training when they join and they should regularly update and refresh their skills and knowledge directors endu cheyunnundavanam avarkulla knowledge up to date aakki konde vekkunnundavanam introduction training avarku kodukkunnundavanam and the directors should be supplied with timely information in order to carry out their duties properly and the directors performance should be annually be evaluated oru directors um proper aayittu thaniyana perform cheyunnallathu oru varsham nammal regularly review cheyondi irikkanam and directors should also be reelected on regular basis which means the maximum period where a director can run will be for the continuous of two period two year period and at the end of the second year that is in the third year itself auditor should be reelected then when it comes to accountability the board should present balanced and understandable assessment of company's position and prospects board in the duty ana company de position ne patti or understandable assessment undaki vekka annalladu avaru thane board is also responsible for maintaining a proper risk management and internal control system for the company and it is also the responsibility of the board in order to ensure that they are uh, the company is maintaining proper relationship with the company's auditors and when it comes to the remuneration so executive directors in the remuneration varaynadu it should always be based on long term success of the company it should never be based on short term success which means that profit in the basis il nere getitta remuneration vekkerudu and the remuneration should also not be determined by uh, any other persons other than the members of the remuneration committee remuneration committee la alagalu mathra remuneration fix cheyan paadalla vera aarum fix cheyan paadilla then when it comes to the relationship with the shareholders we have studied that it is the responsibility of the total board to maintain satisfactory dialogue with the shareholders it is not only the chairman's responsibility whole board of directors should take the responsibility of communicating with the shareholders finally it is the responsibility of the board to communicate uh, to investors and encourage their participation so all the investors should be encouraged on a regular basis and they should attend the annual general meeting as well in addition to this particular set of regulations which are mentioned in the corporate governance code we have also studied about the formation of audit committee every audit committee should be having three non executive directors a bare minimum of three non executive directors out of which one should be financially expert and two others should be financially literate so this is what we mentioned with regarding the non executive directors and this three non executive directors will together form a company's audit committee okay they will together form a committee company's audit committee so this is what we studied as per acc uh, sorry uk corporate governance board okay so we'll be getting questions from this area as well so we'll practice one of the past question paper we'll look at a few points from the past question paper okay see this is the way in which you will be getting questions from the area of corporate governance they will ask you to describe five corporate governance weakness faced by tita company and provide recommendation to address each weakness to ensure compliance with corporate governance principles so literally you want to go through each of the weakness and you need to understand what are the recommendations that need to be provided in relation to the same so everyone please do one thing please read this paragraph and try to pick whatever be the corporate governance weakness in this scenario please go through this everyone
done okay appo parney t company's board is comprised of six executive directors and a non executive chairman and three other non executive directors the chairman and one of the non executive directors are formal executive directors of tangrain and on reaching retirement age were asked to take on non executive roles company has established an audit committee and all nids are members including the chairman who chairs the committee and all four members of the audit committee were previously involved in sales and production related roles so what all are the issues here and they carry out a problem all other so the first thing they have clearly mentioned that they have six executive directors and a non executive chairman and three other non executive directors so what will be the issue here the board is not balanced right there are no equal number of executive directors and non executive directors so what will be the issue that might occur when a board is not balanced there can be chances that they will not be the board of directors the exec non executive directors will not be able to ensure that whether the board make objective decision so there can be chances that the executive directors might dominate the board so that will be the issue and what can you give us the recommendation in that case so you can mention that tita company should consider appointing additional non executive directors to the team and they should ensure that the board should be balanced then what else is the issue so again they have mentioned in the very next line that the chairman and one of the nid are formal executive directors of t company and on reaching the retirement age they were asked to take on non executive roles so what will be the issue in that case so it's clearly represent that the non executive directors are not independent so they were previously involved in executive directors role so what will be the issue there so if they are not able to maintain independence and objectivity in making judgment then automatically they will not be able to perform their responsibilities appropriately and as a response what we can give tita company should remove all the non executive directors who are not independent instead new non executive directors who are having independence should be appointed to the team okay then again there are issues that the company has established an audit committee and all nids are members including chairman who chairs the committee so what will be the issue in that case well we know that the audit committee should be consisting only of independent non executive directors chairman should not be part of the audit committee as he will not be able to maintain independence and objectivity while performing multiple tasks in the company so as a response what we can give chairman should be removed from the audit committee and one of the newly appointed independent non executive directors should be replaced to the chairman's position and very finally there is another problem all the four members of the audit committee were previously involved in sales and production related roles so we have already discussed very clearly that the non executive directors who are having financially literate or who are having financial expertise should only be involved in the audit committee and in case if the audit committee is not having appropriate person with sufficient knowledge there can be chances that they might not be able to carry out their duties properly and what should be the response in that case yeah the most important response will be the fact that the company should consider removing all the members from the non sorry from the audit committee and a new audit committee should be formed who are having financial experts and people with financial expertise or the non executive directors with financial expertise clear clear on amakla okay so this is how you need to pick each of the deficiencies in the corporate governance or the weakness in the corporate governance and you need to provide a corresponding recommendation to overcome each of the corporate governance weakness clear okay so the next and most important area is the area of reporting well we have already studied the area of reporting very well in the earlier sessions so let's quickly go through the area of reporting part so basically well we know that when it comes to reporting we have got multiple types of opinion so basically when it comes to the types of opinion which we need to express on a company's financial statements we'll classify it into two heads which are the types of opinion 
it will consist of modified opinion and unmodified opinion so these are the two types of opinion we need to express over the company's financial statements so the unmodified opinion will be further mentioned as unqualified opinion which means the financial statement shows a true and fair view and the modified opinion will be further be divided into three types which includes qualified opinion adverse opinion and disclaimer of opinion so these are the three types of modified opinion so qualified means the financial statements shows a true and fair view but executive or excluding some reservations adverse opinion means the financial statements does not show a true and fair view and the disclaimer of opinion means that the financial statements we are not able to express our opinion on the financial statements due to the lack of audit evidence. So these are the three types of opinion which we will express over the company's financial statements. So in order to determine which type of opinion we need to express on the company's financial statements, we need to consider whether a mistake is material as well as we need to consider whether a mistake is pervasive. And to understand whether a mistake is material, we can consider either it on the basis of the statement of profit or loss or on the basis of the statement of financial position. And we must consider the mistake also on the basis of its nature. So when it comes to the statement of financial position, we know that we need to consider the total asset and the net asset. When it comes to SOPL, we need to consider profit, gross profit, and the company's revenue. So what's the benchmark of this statement of financial position car total asset? One person. One person. What about the net asset? Two person. Two percentage profit five percentage what about gross profit 0.5 uh, exactly and what about the revenue 0 0.5 0 0.5 it's and while considering whether something is material on the basis of nature which are the main two elements which we need to consider whether it's a matter which relates to a related party transaction which means any transaction with a director any transaction with a company owner any transaction with a parent company, subsidiary company, or joint venture will always be considered as material on the basis of its nature. Or if there is something which affects the company's ability to continue in going concern, that can also be considered as material on the basis of its nature. So this is how we will consider whether a matter is material on the basis of its nature. And after considering the materiality, you must also consider whether a mistake is pervasive. And to understand whether a mistake is pervasive or not, what do we need to do? We need to consider whether the mistake affects multiple areas or multiple elements in the financial statements that will be pervasive. Whether it's a mistake that affects only a single area, but the substantial portion is affected, which means a major portion is affected, then that is pervasive. Or if it is relating to a fundamental accounting disclosure, again, that will be pervasive. But when it comes to exam approach, we will consider whether the profit of the company will be restated into losses after the misstatement are adjusted or whether the losses will be converted into profit after the misstatement are adjusted then it will be treated as pervasive already profit in the company loss like a mistake at the same session i think already loss in the company profit like a mistake at the same session i'm going to profit a lot loss like a loss a lot of profit like a warning i am one of mistake them can that treat you pervasive at a treaty clear i am a client yes. okay then what about the types of opinion consider that there is a mistake in the financial statement misstatement which is not material and not pervasive which opinion we need to express we need to give a unqualified opinion then there is a misstatement which is material and pervasive which opinion adverse opinion when there is a misstatement which is material but not pervasive, in that case, we need to give a qualified opinion. And consider that there is a lack of audit evidence in the financial statements. So we are not able to get evidence relating to a particular mistake. So when there is lack of audit evidence, if the lack of audit evidence is not material and not pervasive, in that case, also we need to give a unqualified opinion. When the lack of audit evidence is material and pervasive, then we need to give disclaimer of opinion. When the lack of audit evidence is material but not pervasive, in that case, we need to give a qualified opinion. Is that clear, everyone? Okay. Yes. 
then in addition to which we have also studied about different types of explanatory paragraphs so which were the explanatory paragraphs which we already studied emphasis of matter paragraph yeah. other matter paragraph key audit matter paragraph other information paragraph material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph appo endha idu makkala emphasis of matter paragraph nu ornale these are the paragraph which are used to specify about any matters which is already appropriately presented and disclosed in the company's financial statements all right already company in the financial statements and other appropriately present and disclose in cheyidu oru karyate kurichu onnum kuda parayanadi use cheyina emphasis of matter paragraph when it comes to other matter paragraph it's a paragraph which is used specifically for the purpose of mentioning about anything that is not mentioned in the financial statements so this will be the factors in relation to the current year audit or about the auditor's responsibility or about the auditor's report other other matter paragraph nu varnal and uh, when it comes to key audit matter paragraph we know that this paragraph is specifically used for the purpose of listed entities so a listed entity da case la already nammala those charge with governance nu communicate cheyad endano aa those charge with governance nu communicate cheyada karyam kaathunnu endengilum users ne inform cheyanengil adu parayan use cheyina paragraph aanu key audit matter paragraph when it comes to other information paragraph it's a paragraph which is specifically used for the purpose of mentioning about other information we know that other information paragraph is mainly used for the purpose of mentioning about mistake in the annual report or to mention about anything relating to annual report you can use other information paragraph then murgc or the material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph it's a paragraph which is specifically used to mention about the going concern and if something when goes if something when uh, wrong with the going concern you will not be able to use this paragraph but you can use this only if the going concern uncertainty is appropriately present and disclosed in the financial statements you can emphasize about the same matter in the material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph for the polo ortho ka going concern matter related uncertainty appropriately present and disclosed anengil mathra irikkum material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph use cheyan better is that clear okay so basically you will be getting questions in relation to the area so when you get a question in relation to the area of reporting so you must be considering multiple factors and then you need to give the answer so this will be the regular requirement that you will be getting for your exam discuss the issue and describe the impact on auditor's report if any should this issue remain unresolved ningalodu choikkum endakkana issues ibide ullathu endana auditor's report ne mele verna impact if the issues remain unsolved okay so everyone please do one thing please read this introductory paragraph
Okay. See, so they have mentioned it over here. It is 1st July 2015. Dashing Company is manufacturing women's clothing and its year end is 30th April 2015. You are an audit supervisor of John T. and Company and the year end audit for the Dashing Company is due to come in shortly. The draft financial statements recognize profit before tax of 2.6 million, total asset of 18 million, and you have been given responsibility for auditing receivables, which is a material balance. And as part of the audit approach, positive receivable circularization is to be undertaken. And as at the planning meeting, finance director of Dashing Company informed the engagement partner that company was closing one of its smaller production sites, and as a result, a number of employees would be made redundant. Redundancy provision of 110,000 is included in the draft financial statements. So this is what it's mentioned with regarding the dashing company. Okay. So they have mentioned here that company is planning to make some of the employees redundant after the year end. So for which they have created a redundancy provision of 110,000. Then a few months have now passed. Audit team is performing the audit field work, including the audit procedures which you recommend over the redundancy provision, the team has calculated the necessary provision should amount to 305,000. The finance director is not willing to adjust the draft financial savings. So it's clearly mentioned here that the provision created by the company is not appropriate because they have created only a provision of 110,000, but the actual amount of provision required is 3,5,000. So, what will be the amount of mistake in this case? So, the actual amount of provision required is 3,5,000. Company have recognized only 110,000. So, what will be the amount of difference here? There will be a difference of 1,95,000, right? So, this can be called as the misstatement. So, in this situation, they have asked us to discuss the issue and describe the impact over the auditor's report if these issues remain unresolved. So what we need to do, we need to find out the impact that will be created over the auditor's report. And to understand the impact, well, we need to do the materiality as well as the pervasiveness. So as you can see over here, the amount of materiality of the misstatement have to be calculated. So the amount of misstatement currently is 195,000. So to calculate the materiality, we can use the figures mentioned over here. They have given us the company's profit before tax and also the total asset of the company, right? Profit before tax and then the total asset and then the So first of all, we need to do one thing. Well, we need to calculate the materiality on the basis of the company's profit and as well as on the basis of the total asset. So 0 0.195, this is the amount of misstatement should it be divided by 2.6 in 200 and when it comes to total asset you have to take 0.195 divided by 18 million into 100 so what will be the amount of profit 0.195 divided by 2.6 into 100 so it will be 7.5 percentage of the profit what about the total asset 0.195 divided by 18 million into 100 so it will be 1.08 percentage of the total asset. So will this misstatement be considered as material in this situation? Yes, it is, right? Because as we mentioned earlier, on the basis of the total asset, any mistake above one percentage will be material. So in this case, it's 1.08 percentage. And on the basis of profit, any misstatement above five percentage is material. Here it's on the basis of um, material, it's 7.5 percentage of the profit. So definitely it is material. And we'll have to consider whether this mistake of 0.195 is pervasive. So can we consider it as a pervasive mistake? Definitely not because the company's profit is already 2.6 million. So if you reduce 0.195 million plus 2.6 from 2.6 million, or if you reduce 1,95,000 from 26 lakhs, it will not be restated into losses. So the company will still be in profit. So it cannot be treated as a pervasive mistake. Clear? So in this situation, we can conclude that it's a mistake which is material, but it is not pervasive. It's a mistake which is material, but it is not pervasive. So in that case, we need to give a, which opinion? Exactly. We need to give a qualified opinion. 
So this is how you need to find out the answer in relation to the reporting. So you will have to calculate the amount of misstatement from the scenario, then try to calculate the materiality. You have to consider materiality in relation to any of the two elements in the financial statements. If the amount is material, either in relation to any one of the figure, it can still be considered as material. And after considering the materiality, you have to calculate whether it is pervasive or not. Finally, you need to mention which opinion you need to express in that case. So in this way or in this manner, you will be finding out the opinion that you need to express over the company's financial statements. Then, once the opinion is finalized, you will have to present your answer. So when you present the answers for the reporting question, first of all, you need to mention the fact in the scenario. So whatever it is actually mentioned in the scenario, the fact have to be picked. Then you need to properly specify the accounting treatment that is required. Accounting treatment required. Then you need to specify about the misstatement in the financial statements. Then specify whether this amount is material or not. Then you need to mention whether it is pervasive. Then you need to express which opinion you need to give on the company's financial statements. And then you need to mention about the basis of opinion which you need to express on the company's financial statements. Just mention that following the opinion paragraph, you should also provide basis of dash opinion in order to quantify the impact of dash misstatement in the company's financial statements. So we will start with the answer. You can take the fact directly from the scenario that the company is planning to make some of the employees redundant after their year end. Therefore, the company have recognized a provision of 110,000 and they have included it in the draft financial statements. However, the audit fieldwork has confirmed that the actual required redundancy provision is 35000 So there's an amount of misstatement of 195000 Then you mentioned the accounting treatment. As per IFRS, uh, sorry, as per IAS 37, provision contingent liability and contingent asset, companies should have created adequate amount of provision for the probable future cash outflow. And since they have not created adequate provision, provision of the company is understated and the profit is overstated. The amount of provision represents 7.5% of the profit and 1.08% of the total asset. Therefore, it is material. However, it cannot be treated as pervasive as the profit is not restated into losses. Since there is a misstatement in the financial statements, which is material but not pervasive, or it should express a qualified opinion stating that except the matters identified in relation to the provision, rest of the financial statements was a true and fair view. Following the opinion paragraph, auditors should also provide a basis of qualified opinion paragraph to quantify the amount of misstatement in relation to the provision that the financial statements are materially misstated. Okay, so this is how you need to present the answers in relation to reporting part. Is that clear, everyone? Yeah. We have already practiced the same in our regular sessions also. Then in addition to which, you must always be considering the way in which you need to present the reporting answers for the going concern as well. So, well, we have studied the reporting for going concern. So basically, well, we know that going concern is one of the most important judgmental area. So there can be chances of having multiple mistakes in relation to the going concern. So we need to consider properly about how we need to report the answers relating to going concern and the actual reporting impact that will be created over the auditor's report if there is any mistake in the company's going concern assumption. Consider that a company's going concern assumption is appropriate. What will be the opinion you will express in that case when the going concern assumption is appropriate? You need to give an unmodified opinion, right? When the going concern assumption is inappropriate, then you need to give an unmodified opinion. Then when the going concern assumption is appropriate, what will we need to go? Going concern assumption is appropriate. First of all, when it is appropriate, you need to give an unqualified opinion when it is appropriate. And when it is inappropriate, you need to give an adverse opinion. So as we learned earlier, when the company's going concern assumption is appropriate, but when there is an uncertainty and which is adequately disclosed, in that case, we'll be giving an unmodified opinion. But in addition to the unmodified opinion, we have studied that we must also provide material uncertainty relating to going concern paragraph also. And then when the going concern assumption is appropriate, 
but there's an uncertainty which is not adequately disclosed. In that case, what we need to do, we need to give a qualified opinion, but in addition to the qualified opinion, if the going concern is also not disclosed, then we need to give adverse opinion. If the uncertainty alone is not disclosed, then qualified opinion. If going concern is also disclosed, then adverse opinion need to be expressed. Then if the management is unwilling to make the assessment, if the management is unwilling to make the assessment in relation to going concern, in that case, we need to give disclaimer of opinion. Or if the management is unwilling to extend the assessment, or if they haven't done the assessment completely, then in that case, we need to give qualified opinion. So you have to keep in mind these steps. Well, we have studied and we have practiced questions in relation to these areas as well. So please do revise this area in relation to the going concern reporting. Okay. So this is how you need to present the answers in relation to the going concern as well. So these are the major areas where we have got three areas in total to discuss for the day. We have got the areas of corporate governance, ethics, and in addition to which we have also discussed about the reporting part. So these are the main areas. So whenever you get a question in relation to the reporting part, you should always try to read the scenario very properly. And you need to, first of all, identify the actual mistake in the financial statements. Then once you find out the mistake in the company's financial statements, then you need to focus on the area where it is specified about the accounting treatment. So you need to mention the accounting treatment that is actually required, then specify the misstatement about what went wrong in that case. Then immediately after that, you need to consider whether the amount of mistake is material. And after considering the amount of materiality, you will have to consider whether the amount of mistake is pervasive or not. And once you consider the pervasiveness, you need to show uh, which opinion you need to give in that case. And finally, you need to mention about the impact over the basis of opinion as well. So this is how in total you will be giving answers in relation to the reporting part. Then, as we mentioned earlier, you need to focus on the area of, uh, you need to focus on the area of the, yeah, you need to focus on the area of corporate governance as well. Whenever you write the weakness in relation to the corporate governance, just identify the weakness, just explain it. And on the other side, give the recommendation on the way in which you can overcome that particular weakness. Then on the other area, when it comes to the area of ethical threats and safeguards, you need to consider about how this ethical threat is going to affect your audit or the auditor's objectivity. So you have to pick the particular threat from the scenario directly, identify the threat, explain it, and mention how it is going to create an ethical threat to objectivity. As a safeguard, you need to mention about how you can overcome the ethical threat. So this is what you need to write in relation to each of the question during the course of your exam. Okay. So everyone do ensure that you practice all of this area for maximum number of times. Well, we have practiced multiple questions from these areas except when it comes to the area of corporate governance and uh, ethical threats, because we are having only very limited number of questions in the revision kit as well in relation to these areas. So do practice all these areas for maximum number of times as possible. And in addition to which, you should also be focusing on the other areas as well. When it comes to the area of internal controls and audit risk, well, we know that we have got a lot of questions in the revision and we have also practiced most majority of them. But do ensure that you are also practicing the same question again and again for maximum number of times since you are having repetition questions from those areas. Okay. All right. So please do revise the other areas as well and do ensure that you have got a clear picture about this area. Practice and practice and practice all these areas for maximum number of times and do ensure that you're also having a clear picture on the other theoretical areas as well. Okay. Is that clear, everyone? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. All right, so you will be getting updates on the further classes in our group itself. So please do ensure that you are revising all these areas. And as I mentioned earlier, please practice all the questions for maximum number of times as possible. Okay. All right. So that's it, guys. So that's all for the day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.